renewing, <coughs> recycling, renovating, restoring. These are very common words in our everyday speech, aren't they, uh, these days? I mean, if we go back a few years, I suppose recycling wasn't a word that many of us would be familiar with at all, really. But it's part and parcel of our daily lives now. Every week, uh, we're doing some sort of recycling, aren't we? And uh, the statistics often come out in terms of how different countries are doing in terms of their recycling rates. And uh, I believe Wales is one of the, the top, apparently, for recycling. And uh, our own county, apparently, was one of the worst. But apparently, I was now one of the best, I think, uh, in Wales in terms of recycling. So we're used to this idea of recycling. And not just in terms of putting things away week by week in terms of the rubbish that can be uh, made into new things. But people talk about upcycling as well, where things can be reused, have a, a new life, a new use. Uh, people talk about renovating things, restoring perhaps uh, furniture. There are programs about this on the television, so you can see programs where they ha find a, a house that's uh, dilapidated, it's ruined, it's, it's gutted, and people come along and they, uh, they restore it, they renovate it and bring it back to its, its glory, as it were. Uh, and then there are other programs where people have treasured possessions, uh, they're a bit battered, uh, they're not quite as they were, and they bring them along to these experts, uh, and they have their skills, and they, they transform it. They bring something back to life in a remarkable way. So these are words that we're used to, these are ideas that we see that are part of everyday life. Renewing, recycling, renovating, Restoring, and we're used to that with things, items. But what about people? What about restoring people? Now, there are, of course, uh, again, there are programs about this as well, where people may want to reverse perhaps the effects or the signs of aging. Uh, and so they might have various procedures done to help them in that way. So, restoring perhaps youthful appearance, uh, perhaps trying to turn back their biological clock by improving their health in different ways. And there are certain things then, medically or otherwise, that can do things to perhaps renew in some ways or restore. But what about the more profound things about our lives, about our attitudes, about our behavior, about the way we relate to other people. These things that may do things superficially can't really deal with those more profound things. And I think maybe the, the most vivid example I can think of somebody who exemplifies this was a footballer, a famous footballer back in the 1960s and 70s. Some will remember him, George Best. Uh, he was uh, a really skillful football player, played for Manchester United, played for Northern Ireland. But he had a major problem in his life in terms of drink. He uh, had this problem drinking alcohol to excess. But he was given a liver transplant. Uh, and yet the tragedy of his situation was that though he had that liver transplant, he had that medical procedure, so part of his life was restored in that sense, was renewed, a new liver. He went back to his old ways. And he found himself going back to patterns of excessive drinking. And his life really fell apart from that point on. So the things that could deal perhaps in some aspects couldn't deal with the big issues of his life. Now, 
We're going to be looking this morning at the words of a man who knew what it was as well to fall tragically in his life and to be in the depths about whether he could come out of that. Was it possible for somebody who'd fallen so badly to be restored? That's what this psalm that we're going to be looking at this morning is about. And this again is a dramatic situation, as we'll see. You might say it's an extreme situation, but that's a help, really, because it tells us that if our situation is perhaps not as extreme, if God can do and work and help somebody in such an extreme situation, he can help you, he can help me. When we find ourselves having fallen and having failed, and maybe also finding ourselves, like this man, in despair. So I want us to look this morning at Psalm 51 with a message that it's speaking a message of hope for restoration. Hope for restoration. And if you're this morning feeling, well, I can't be the person I should be. I can't be, live a life for God. I can't live with integrity before others. This psalm, I hope, will speak to you a message that can restore your hope, that you can be renewed, that you can be restored to live and to serve God. So let's have a look at what this psalm has to say. Now, in the reading of the psalm, I left out the heading. And if you've got the psalm in front of you, you may well see in your Bible there's a heading to this psalm. And it says this, a psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. So the psalm is linked to that particular incident in the life of David. King David, Israel's greatest king, and yet here we have him in the depths of despair because great though he was, he had failed miserably in his life and his private life mattered these days as people tend to dissociate their public life from their private life and that can come up in the public domain from time to time but god and david knew this god was concerned with david's private life as well as his public life and that's true of every single one of us. We've all got a public life that people see. We've all got a private life as well. And God sees that too. What does he see in your private life? What does he see in my private life? God had seen into David's private life and he had failed catastrophically as a king. He was meant to be a shepherd of the people. He was meant to... Uh, uphold justice. He was meant to care for the poor. He was meant to have a concern uh, for people. But he abused his role and took advantage, as we see, of another man's wife. What a dreadful thing he had done in his role, in his public role, and in his private life as well. He had, as the, as the heading here says in the NIV, committed adultery with Bathsheba and on top of that and it doesn't say this but on top of that as you read the, the account and you can read about it in the second book of Samuel chapters 11 and 12 he contrived to get Bathsheba's husband killed so he piled iniquity on top of iniquity that's the situation. Here he is then, in the depths of despair. And he felt that despair. And he knew that. Was there a possibility of coming out? Was there a possibility of being restored, of being renewed? Both as king, before God, before others, and in his, in his personal life. Well, he needed to be brought to face the reality of his actions, didn't he? And we see that in these words in the psalm. Uh, 
So in verses 1 and 2, he talks, he hasn't got enough words really to describe what he's done. He talks about it as being a transgression. He's crossed the line. And, and we use that expression, don't we, today? We say that somebody is, they, they cross the line. Uh, there's a certain limit to somebody's behavior maybe, but no, that, that crossed the line. And David knew that. He crossed the line in doing what he had done. And then, as he thought about it, he thought his, uh, his behavior was iniquitous as well. He uses that word iniquity here. There was something perverse, there's something twisted about it. And that certainly was the case. He was a man who was so twisted that he was prepared to uh, involve this other woman's uh, husband to get him killed. What a twistedness. Iniquity. And then he can describe his actions uh, as sin. In other words, falling short, missing the mark. And he'd missed the mark in a very obvious way, hadn't he? Didn't the law of God say, thou shalt not commit adultery? And he had missed the mark terribly in that way. And he'd been brought to see it by God sending the prophet Nathan to him. And so he says in verse 3, I know my transgressions, he says. I know my transgressions. And more than that, my sin is always before me. Always before me. The kind of thing, then, that keeps you awake at night. And there are things that keep us awake at night, aren't there? Um, it may be things that we're planning for tomorrow that keep us awake at night. There may be concerns we have about family members that can keep us awake at night. But there are also times when there are things that we have done and said that can keep us awake at night. And we can sometimes find diversionary tactics and they may help for a little bit. So we might throw ourselves into our work and our mind is taken off it during working day. Or we might try to pamper ourselves. Uh, we might have a, a spa day or do something like that. And we enjoy that time, but we can't escape this. We might go on a holiday. And, uh, and people seek to do that sometimes, to get away from it all. There's no running away, is there? from this kind of situation where God puts his finger on our life, keeps us awake. My sin, he said, is always before me. He knows himself, he describes himself as being unclean as well. That's interesting, unclean. These days we're used to people perhaps who've been the victims of crime, describing themselves as being unclean. Perhaps those who've been raped in particular, they say they feel unclean. They're the victims, or they've been violated. People perhaps who've been robbed, or something's happened to them, they feel violated, uh, dirty and unclean. But here is David, the perpetrator, saying that he is unclean. And that's because God has put his finger on his life and he knows that in the sight of God he is not fit to come before him. That he cannot really approach him. He can't really live and serve God as he is. He's disqualified. He's disqualified in that way. And these days when there are some gross things that take place perhaps in somebody's professional public life that can happen too uh, so you might hear of somebody um, somebody who is in the medical profession being disqualified from continuing to practice because they've done something that is just 
beyond the pale, as it were. Or it could happen in any kind of walk of life. They've been barred, they've been disqualified. And David knows that. He's unclean. He's using a term that was so common uh, in his day, in the days of the, the Old Testament, this idea of being unclean. We don't use it so much today. But he was saying, in effect, I can't live before other people. I'm, I'm unclean. I can't live before you. Well, how does this psalm, how do, how do his words give us hope for restoration? Well, this is the first thing I want to bring out then in the light of his situation, that God can wipe the slate clean. God can wipe the slate clean. And it's because David knows that that he can appeal to God to do this. You, O oh God, he knows. You can wipe the slate clean. And that's what he's saying there in verse 7. Cleanse me, he says, and I shall be clean. Cleanse me, and I shall be clean. Now, he expresses himself, again, because he's from a time of the Old Testament, in Old Testament terms. So he says, cleanse me with hyssop. Well, what was hyssop? Well, hyssop was a little plant, uh, and it was used in the rituals of the people of God at the time. And it was used to sprinkle blood, uh, which was seen as a, a cleansing, symbol of a cleansing agent, sometimes on people, people promising to live for God, sometimes on items, th things that needed to be restored, things that need to be brought back to be able to be useful for God and for the community. So he expresses himself in those terms and says, cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Blot out, he says, all my iniquity. Cleanse me. And this idea of cleaning something so that it can be used properly again is something that we have today as well in different situations. I can remember situations where something's gone wrong with our computer uh, and people have said, well, it's all to do with the hard drive. The hard drive needs to be cleaned. Uh, it's, it's failed because it's become infected by... Uh, some electronic virus. So you need to clean the hard drive. And until it's clean, until this thing that's affected it is out of the system, it's not going to work again. So you need to clean the hard drive. And David is saying he needs to be cleansed. He needs to have this situation purified in his life. Now we haven't got these rituals that David went through, but we've got something better. We've got the Lord Jesus Christ who shed his blood that might cleanse and wipe the slate clean. And this is what one of the writers of the New Testament says and puts it very clearly before us. He says, if the blood of goats and bulls with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctifies those who have been defiled of David so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our consciences from dead works to worship or to serve the living God. And that, my friends, is the first encouragement, first hope that this psalm speaks to us in our situation, our day. Whatever our sin may be, what our failure may be,
the slate can be wiped clean by God. As you cry out to him, cleanse me, I'll be clean, wash me, I'll be white in the soul, blot out all my iniquity. So that's the first thing. And that, of course, wipes the slate clean from the past, doesn't it? David needed that desperately. And there are situations in our lives where we need that desperately. The past to be wiped clean. But then what about the present? And what about tomorrow? What about the future? And this is where we've got a big problem. Uh, and David knew that problem, and he speaks about it in this psalm, in verses 5 and 6. Verses 5 and 6 may well begin in the same way in, in your Bible translation. It does here in the Bible I'm using. Both verses begin, surely. And he's saying that because he want to, he's underlining to himself a truth, two truths that he knows, and two truths that create a problem, really, for us as we seek to live today and tomorrow. And what are these problems? Well, the first thing is this. I've been born, I've been a sinner from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Now, just to say, he's not saying here that his own birth has come about as a result of some sin on his mother's part. It's not as if he's confessing his mother's sin. He's confessing his sin, as we see in this psalm. And he's not saying either that somehow uh, birth or the process of giving birth or having children in itself is something that is sinful. So he's not saying that. He's saying something about himself. He's, something, he's saying that uh, sin is something that's characterized him from his earliest days. It's part of his fabric. And I think we know that. If you, have, you don't have to uh, teach children uh, to be disobedient. You have to encourage them to be obedient. Children will easily say no to something. Isn't this a reality? Isn't this a situation? So he's saying, there's this truth about my very life. And that's true of every single one of us, that we are touched by sin from our very earliest days, from the moment we come from our mother's womb. So that's a problem. And the problem's worse because in verse 6 he says, and here's another truth, but surely you desire truth in the inner parts. So here's the problem. God desires truth in the inner parts. And yet I know that there's a problem with me in my inward parts as it were. And it's there from the beginning. How can we resolve it? Because I need it resolved if I'm going to live today and tomorrow in a way that pleases God and is good for other people. Well, here's the second hope that comes to us from the psalm that David gives to us. And it's in his prayer in verse 10. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. He speaks about a heart and he speaks about a spirit. So why a pure heart? Why a heart? Well, because in the days of the psalmist, the heart was the center of somebody's very being. It was like the, the wellspring from which came thoughts, morals, behavior, everything. And the Lord Jesus Christ emphasized this in his own day. People were discussing at some points 
what makes you clean, what, what makes you unclean. And Jesus brings out this truth so clearly. He says, out of men's heart, out of people's hearts, flow. And he spoke about words and actions. The whole range of human behavior coming out of the heart is how he put it. Much as David saw here, the heart as being the center of everything. So there's no wonder that he speaks about needing a clean heart. A clean heart. Now I said, mentioned earlier on about uh, uh, a computer having a hard drive to be clean. Well, I'm sure you've got a device, or more than one device, in, in your home or on your person where there's a little button that's a reset button. Uh, and if all fails and try to sort out a problem with this device, you press the reset button. Uh, or sometimes it talks about factory settings or manufacturer setting. And really it's a bit like David saying, that he wants God, he needs God to do that for him, to press the reset button, to go back to the factory setting, to go back to how it left the maker's hand, as it were. That's the kind of thing that he's saying here, because he knows he can't do it himself. He needs the only one, the maker, has to intervene at this point. And it's interesting that David uses the word here, create. And uh, it's interesting that, that that word in the Old Testament is only ever used of God making or doing things. Now, of course, the Bible talks about various people making, and you might say they're creating certain things, make the tabernacle and so on, gifted, so on. But never does the Old Testament use the word create to describe what humans can do, even though they may be very skillful. It describes something that God alone can do. God alone can give you a clean heart. God alone can give you a new beginning. But what a wonderful news that is, what a wonderful encouragement that is, that we, like David, can turn to the Creator and say, create in me a pure heart, O oh God. And he speaks about a steadfast spirit, steadfast. That was one thing that David was not. He had not been steadfast in his heart. He hadn't been upright. He hadn't been willing to obey God. So again, he, he expresses himself in that way that he needs God to intervene. He needs God to help him, to give him that steadfastness, to give him that uprightness. Grant me, he says in verse 12, a willing spirit to sustain me. I need your help to be sustained. And he knew that he needed that because he could look at his predecessor, Saul. And if you know the story of Saul, who was David's predecessor as king, God did something dramatically drastic in Saul's life. He took away the spirit that had been granted to him to serve as king. God took it away. David prays that that might not be his fate as well. Instead, give me a willing spirit to sustain me. Only Jesus Christ now can give us that radical change of a new heart and a new spirit in our lives. And when Paul the Apostle was writing to Christians in the church in Ephesus, he speaks about this. He speaks about Christians, he describes himself as, uh, as one of them, 
uh, speaks for, for all Christians. He says, for we are his workmanship, his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. In other words, for a life of doing good, of living for God and living for others, living in a way that is pleasing to him. You need to call on Jesus Christ. You need to call on him to give you that new heart, that new spirit. God can give a new start is what is the second hope that we have from this psalm. He can wipe the slate clean. That's our first hope. Deal with the past. And he can give a new start for the present and for the future. And the result of that, the result of these two, two actions on God's part, is that we can serve him again. And David dares to speak in those terms in this psalm. And the first thing he imagines him being, himself being is being an instructor. He says that in verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways. I will teach transgressors your ways. And sinners will turn back to God. Here was somebody then who would be able to speak to others with authority about God and all his ways. I will teach transgressors your ways. And that would include, I think, many things. It would include the fact that God does call us to account. Earlier in the psalm, we haven't looked at this, but earlier in the psalm in verse 4, he speaks about God being proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. So David would be able to speak, yes, I know about that way, that God is a judge. He's judged me. He's found me wanting. I will teach transgressors your ways and remind them that you are the one who calls us all to account. Whether now, in the here and now, or whether in the day that we stand before him, I will teach them this. I will tell them. And he can speak powerfully from his experience. He'll be able to teach them about the fact that God is one who has laid down good directions for our lives. Directions that he's rediscovered having wandered away from them. Yes, I'll teach transgressors your ways, good ways, ways of righteousness. As another psalm says, walking in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. But I'll also be able to teach them your ways that you are merciful. As we sang at the beginning of our service, yes, he's holy, as David found out. But he's also merciful and mighty in his ways. We have the privilege before too long of having this life 22, don't we, of coming up. And maybe we'll have an opportunity to be able to speak to others of your ways, God's ways. Ways of mercy. Good ways. So, David is saying to us here that God can enable us to serve anew. That's the third hope that this psalm speaks to us. He enables us to serve anew. And if we feel this morning, and if you're a believer, let's remember that David is speaking here as a believer, that all is over, you can't serve him again. His psalm is there to encourage you, to say that you can be cleansed, we can be renewed, we can be restored. And if you want to find somebody in the New Testament, think of the Apostle Peter, 
who denied his Lord, he failed him so disastrously. Again, an extreme situation. But he was called then to shepherd the flock, to feed the lambs. He becomes somebody who does, just like David says, he teaches transgressors God's ways. And sinners did turn back to God as a result of his ministry. So there's a message for us here. If we cannot forgive ourselves, and we can find that sometimes, God can forgive. God can cleanse. God can give a new start. And it's a message for the church as well, isn't it? To receive back and to restore those who have, like David, wandered and failed. And the Apostle Paul had to remind the church in Corinth about that. Uh, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, there's a situation where a man is sleeping with his stepmother. And Paul says, well, this, this can't be right. You, you have to address it as a church. Uh, and, he, uh, and in effect, he, the person is put out. But then in this second letter to them, uh, to the Corinthians, he may well be referring to that same situation later where he says, no, look, if this person now is truly repentant and has shown the signs of that, has been doing the kind of things that David has said here, asked for cleansing, has uh, been restored, then you need to receive back. You need to restore. So uh, this has a message then for the church and for us in terms of how we deal with people who may have wandered and failed even grossly and radically. Because God is able to enable us, all of us, to serve him anew. And one of the ways we serve him as well, and we need to remember, is in our worship, to worship God and David knows about that. And so he says, O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. He's able to serve God, to worship God, with his words, with his lips, as well as with his actions. Well, we started thinking about recycling items goods, things. And then the bigger problem of restoring or renewing people. The message of this psalm is that there's hope for restoration. That we might be cleansed, slate white clean. That we might have a new start. That we might be able to serve him anew. May God help us in that. Amen.